Hi, welcome to the Bioinformatics Chat. Today, my guests are Keith Slotkin and Koshik Panda. Keith and Koshik are studying mobile DNA, and uh, Keith recently published a paper titled The Case for Not Masking Away Repetitive DNA. And so we'll be talking about uh, repetitive DNA and transposable elements and uh, try to get a little bit of education on, on those very important concepts. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Roman, for having me as well. Okay, uh, let's start with your backgrounds. I'm curious how you got to study transposable elements. Kashik, let's start with you. I'm currently a postdoctoral associate working with Keith. Uh, I joined Keith's lab as a graduate student back in 2011. And back then, this concept of transposable elements was very interesting to me because traditionally, I was always taught with this very specific position, some genes, and the idea that there can be something in the genome that can move around and uh, cause multiple copies was very interesting to me. And then I had some background in computer uh, before I joined Keith's lab. So I was quickly absorbed as a bioinformatics person uh, and transitioned from a wet lab uh, to bioinformatics and start working and understanding how are these repetitive regions silenced and prevented from affecting a genome. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, Keith, what about you? What, what was your path like? Well, my path uh, was originally, um, I, when I was a graduate student at, at UC Berkeley, um, I was already into to plant biology. And uh, I joined a lab to do a rotation that was studying epigenetics. And the, the mentor there, would, who I ended up following to do my graduate work, a guy named Damon Lish, uh, he, he just started me on this project. And he started explaining transposable elements in, in repetitive DNA to me. And I never heard of it. And I thought they were really cool. And the way he explained it was kind of like the bad boys of biology, these kind of things that people would ignore, they wouldn't talk about. But they were responsible for a lot of new gene creation or uh, changing rates of mutation, which can really uh, change the, the rate of, of evolution. And he really sold them to me. And uh, I've been studying them ever since. I studied them uh, as an undergraduate, uh, a graduate student, uh, postdoc, and now obviously in my own lab. But being both a plant biologist and studying transposable elements, I'm, I'm doubly studying something that a lot of people ignore. <laughs> so there's, <laughs> there's That's probably, very true, yeah. yeah. So there's probably something there that I like in my personality, that I like studying the, the things that, that have slipped under everyone else's radar. Let's start with the basics. What is a repeat and what is a transposable element? What's the relationship between those two concepts? Well, um, a, a repeat is very broad. It's just something that um, is going to be in a in a particular genome multiple times. It could there can be genes that are repeat where the gene has been duplicated a number of times, um, uh, and then there are things like tandem repeats, uh, microsatellites, and then as a subcategory of repeats are going to be the transposable elements, which are broadly defined as fragments of DNA that can have the potential ability to uh, mobilize or duplicate themselves from one region of the genome to another and to insert into another part of the genome. And there's lots of different flavors or types of these transposable elements that all use different mechanisms. But we use transposable elements as a blanket term for all of these, uh, all of these elements with that particular ability. Right. So what are some of these mechanisms? How, how does this transposable elements manage to copy themselves? There are some mechanisms that are RNA-based. So the element will make itself into an RNA copy and then make a, a, a what's called a copy DNA or cDNA copy of itself and integrate into the genome that way. Those are called retrotransposons because of its retro to the current dog or the central dogma of DNA to RNA. So this is going back from RNA to DNA. There are DNA transposons, which um, create proteins that, that pick up the whole element as a fragment of DNA and transpose it into the genome. And there are a number of different types of mechanisms of those, including something called a helitron that does it a little differently. But basically, they can be classified on how they move, and then how they move is reflected in their structure of DNA sequence. So what triggers uh, this this process? Because if these transposable elements uh, would be copying 
all the time at the same rate as, for example, transcription or replication happens, then our genomes would just grow uncontrollably and, and become very huge. So clearly this is not, and, and also the genes would get disrupted when these transposable elements get themselves inserted inside the genes. So this is not happening too much. What is stopping them? What are the constraints? There are specific uh, mechanisms that the host uh, or the genome actually employs to try and stop the transposable elements from doing that. Uh, By default, they would like to make as many copies of themselves uh, as possible. But there is quite a bit of investment on a cell's part to try and identify which are the transposable elements which are making multiple copies. And there are multiple levels of silencing. They can be stopped Uh, at the transcription level, prevented from making an RNA transcript to begin with, or their transcript can be degraded later. There are uh, DNA methylation mechanisms, which specifically tell the cell that these are the regions that needs to be shut down pretty strongly so that they don't make copies of uh, themselves. And But there can be multiple environmental triggers or like sometimes there are also examples of specific mutations in the silencing mechanisms that might actually allow the transposable element from being expressed. Right. So there is like evolutionary pressure against these transposable elements being active all the time. So the cell is sort of aware of their presence and, and tries to silence them. Yeah, the analogy that's been made is uh, very similar to a virus versus its host. It's an evolutionary arms race where the host is, is trying to repress transposable element activity. The transposable elements are trying to do what they do is to transpose. And there's an arms race uh, in identifying new mechanisms and then counter defenses to those new mechanisms to, uh, to in this evolutionary battle uh, for activity versus silencing. That That analogy ignores some of the real benefits that transposable elements can have to a genome, but uh, nonetheless is a useful framework that we often use in the laboratory. What are those benefits? Well, uh, a transposable element, um, the, the process of transposition itself is inherently sloppy, and uh, transposable elements often pick up or, or, or co-opt fragments of genes um, and can rearrange those genes or mix several parts of different genes together. And there's cases in which transposable elements have created a a novel gene with different domains that never existed before because of their gene scrambling ability. In addition, famously discussed by McClintock, who, you know, discovered transposable elements, there's this idea that, that transposable elements, which can, can rapidly affect the rate of, of selection and evolution because of their changing the rate of mutation, they can activate under times of stress and potentially uh, help um, uh, an animal or plant uh, or fungi um, overcome that stress by creating mutations that and hitting on that one in a million mutation that may help overcome that particular challenge. So you made this analogy between transposable elements and viruses, and viruses usually have to encode the the machinery needed to, for example, embed themselves into the, the DNA. But these transposable elements, are they similar in that Um, They try to encode this transposase, or do they rely on the cell to to perform this function? They encode the proteins necessary for their transposition. So I want to make a distinction that that we differentiate transposable elements into two categories. Uh, What's called autonomous or auto, meaning that it can replicate itself. It produces all the necessary, it produces this proteins necessary to replicate itself. And then non-autonomous, which is um, if those proteins were made by an autonomous element, they could act on the non-autonomous element to transpose it. So there's a a master-slave analogy here where you have the master elements that can mobilize these other ones as well. And in the genome, in any genome, uh, the non-autonomous elements, I should say any eukaryotic genome, the non-autonomous elements, um, are, there's many more of them. They outweigh probably 100 to 1, if not more, the actual autonomous elements that can transpose themselves because transposable element fragments are essentially everywhere. Um, but the, the proteins that they often encode will just do the basic function of mobilizing the DNA. They often don't 
re- they don't carry the proteins to finish the process. They rely on the cell's repair mechanisms uh, of its DNA, which are which are host encoded, to kind of clean up the transposition process to finish um, whether it's to ligate the DNA or or, or finish the base uh, uh, insertion uh, to to make the perfect insertion site. So they don't they require that maybe let's say the cutout mechanism uh, and to insertion mechanism, but not the the finishing polishing of the DNA, they rely on the mechanisms that are already around for that. So these transposable elements, then uh, they actually encode proteins, especially the autonomous ones. Do they, um, uh, like some viruses, can they encode multiple proteins in the same uh, sort of transcription unit? Or uh, is it the case that multiple transposable elements uh, need to be transcribed in order to activate this machinery? Uh, no, they they can actually encode uh, multiple uh, proteins, and sometimes the RNA transcript can be spliced, and that can give rise to a different transcript, give rise to a different proteins. And so they can encode four to five different proteins that they require specifically for their processes. Not all of them have to be uh, functional, uh, but that kind of determines whether or not that transposable element actually moves. And uh do we know anything about how these things arose? Are they uh, just very ancient viruses that embedded themselves into our DNA, or uh, do they arise inside the, the DNA itself? Well, this is a this is a topic of great debate in the field. So we know there are cases in which transposable elements um, have come from disabled viruses. So a virus can uh, replicate itself and then leave the cell typically packaging itself um, in a protein coat and then and then infect another individual. So transposable elements are often generated from these viruses when they lose this ability to leave the cell, but they can still replicate themselves and insert in new places in the DNA. So we have lots of examples where uh, a virus without an envelope protein to leave the cell is now a transposable element. On the other hand, we know cases in which a transposable element has picked up a new function and become a virus. So uh, there's a back and forth there that it's very difficult to go back to the very beginning and uh, is is something that people discuss vigorously at the transposable element type meetings. That's very cool. Can you can you tell us more about that transposable element that became a virus? Oh, a transposable element that became a virus. There are cases uh, in which people have uh, identified uh, a transposable element. Um, these are typically retro transposons that uh, that are, are already similar in structure to um, to a retrovirus like HIV, for example. And the retrovirus has picked up uh, a new coding region. Uh, transposable elements love to pick up pieces of DNA and rearrange uh, pieces of DNA, and those can be genes. And if they pick up a, a region of DNA that has a you know, selective advantage for that transposable element, it will obviously be selected for and, and used. So that process is called exaptation or co-option, where, where they're using something for a purpose in which it was not originally uh, evolved for in the cell. Uh, and so you can have cases where now the transposable element can, um, can, can pick up a new function. This is a new weapon in that arms race that I was talking about and potentially leave the cell and uh, infect another cell. My understanding is that these transposable elements, when they manage to activate themselves, they get transcribed by RNA polymerase 3, as opposed to RNA polymerase 2 that transcribes uh, most of, of the genes. Uh, can you talk about the significance of, of this? What, what does this mean for, for this whole process? Well, autonomous transposable elements, ones that make proteins, those protein coding transcripts need to be produced by RNA polymerase 2. Um, RNA polymerase 3 replicates sign elements, which are the non-autonomous family counterparts to line elements. Uh, line elements are the retrotransposons that are highly abundant and, and can be active in, in human, mouse, and, and chimpanzee primates um, and mammals. So th- th- these, these line elements really dominate our genomes, our human genomes, and they give rise to, to signs, these small uh, non-autonomous transposable elements, which there are just tons of in the human genome. And 
these signs are uh, duplicated using RNA polymerase 3. So this is not a general transposable element mechanism in which uh, pole 3 or RNA polymerase 3 replicates transposable elements. This is very specific to a transposable element type that is highly abundant in the human genome. Got it. Yeah. But how does, uh, whether, whether a uh, gene, I guess, or a gene-like element, whether it's transcribed using RNA polymerase 2 or 3, how does that affect its fate? Uh, you said that these lines, they have to be transcribed by RNA polymerase 2. Why is that the case? Well, the lines are protein coding. So to make that polyadenylated mRNA transcript that's going to be destined for cytoplasmic export and translation, that those are pole 2 transcripts. And so that's, those pole 2 transcripts are actually absolutely required for the protein that's necessary to move the non-autonomous element. Um, the, the, the sign elements um, being regulated by pole 3 uh, may be, uh, th this is speculation, but it may be advantageous because pole 3, as far as we understand, those types of promoters aren't under the same level of uh, spatial and temporal regulation as a pole 2 promoter. Um, I, I don't know as much about pole 3 promoters, and I'm sure there's people out there that would argue with this, but, but the pole 3 promoters that we've used in the laboratory seem to be generally uh, constitutively expressed at a pretty high uh, level. So they don't have the dynamic regulation that a pole 2 promoter often has. So pole 3 expression um, is just, you know, pretty high and pretty much everywhere. And that may be a general mechanism uh, of evasion of uh, regulation that's based on pole 2 transcriptional control. Ah, that makes sense. But does that then mean that these signs, they are being expressed all the time? Do they just do nothing there or do they do anything? Well, there's so darn many of signs that it's hard to put them into, it's hard to say one thing for signs because there are in the tens of thousands of copies. And so people have broken them down into subfamilies and studied those individual subfamilies of signs like ALU is a really, uh, ALU is a very uh, commonly discussed uh, sign element. So I know signs uh, absolutely can be expressed even when they're not transposing. Um, they can absolutely affect the transcription of neighboring genes or genes in which they sit in the UTRs or the introns. Uh, they may, they may not. It's very difficult to, to really understand their specific function. But we now know that a lot of these signs, when they transpose and locate near genes, they can uh, evolve into things like regulatory domains or protein binding sites and affect the, the transcription of that promoter and may even become a, a promoter regulatory element. So we've thrown around these uh, abbreviations like signs and lines. Uh, let's dig into them a bit deeper and let's take them one by one. So let's start with the lines, right? What, what does that acronym stand for? And uh, what can you tell us about it? Lines is actually an interesting story. I mean, I've never read this, but this is what I've heard, is that, you know, line has a specific definition, long interspersed nuclear element. And, uh, but the, but the, the, the story that goes along with this is that when people were studying the human genome uh, and doing southern blots, what you would do is take uh, total human genomic DNA, digest it with a restriction enzyme, and run that on a long gel electrophoresis. And if you just look at that gel, uh, it's a general smear because you have so much DNA of all these different sizes, but you then have very specific lines that appear <laughs> on the gel. And, and what are those lines? Because they're pieces of DNA upon this restriction digest that are piling up, these are repetitive DNA. These are um, the, the, the transposable element. And lines make up, I, I, I think the number is 23% of the total human genome are, are long interspersed nuclear elements. So, uh, so, so the huge, you know, huge percentage of, of, uh, it, much more than the percentage of the human genome that's made up of all genes, for example. So, uh, so these, that's where lines came from. And then once they had lines, which are the long ones, then, uh, then they had signs, which were the short ones. So short interspersed nuclear elements. Um, and so there's a lot of naming transposable elements, I should say, is absolutely the wild, wild west. Uh, you know, they have, some really funny examples. There's a very well-studied retrotransposon studied by uh, a lab that initiated in, in, in Spain that was called Gypsy. And then there was a locus that they identified that controlled Gypsy movement. And so they called that flamenco because flamenco made Dipsy jump or Dipsy dance. <laughs> And so there are lots of cases. It's basically if you discover a transposable element, you get to name it. 
And uh, and so there's all sorts of interesting or funny examples of hobos or mutators or, um, you know, or the original McClintock was uh, ACDS, which was disassociation and then the activator of that disassociation because the chromosome kept breaking at that site. It can be maddening to people when they start out because we now have systems in which we try to code them in a in a hierarchical logical way of what type of super family, what type of family, what type of element this is. But if you're just looking at the name and you find a transposable element that's called jockey, for example, that tells you nothing about the organism or what kind of transposable element it was up to the person who found it to name it. Do you classify this uh elements based on their history like you, you said you can classify them into families and subfamilies so uh, how does that work so we don't classify them based on their history as much as as their um their type of of element so typically there's a coding system that people have created a three-letter coding system which would would start with like a d or an r so is it a dna transposon or a retro transposon that's the very very first distinction and Almost in almost all cases, you can just look at the sequence of a transposable element and say, is it encoding a transposase-like protein? Um, or look at its ends. Are they direct repeats or inverted repeats at the ends? And see that an element is a DNA transposon versus a retro transposon. Okay, so that's the first subcategorization that can be done. And then from there, you can say, okay, well, is it, you know, there's two major classes of of retro transposons. There's what are called the line elements, and then there are the uh, LTR retro transposons, and that stands for long uh, terminal repeat. And these have long terminal repeats at their ends, and those are real easy to spot by looking at their sequence. And these lines and LTR retro transposons have different mechanisms of transposition, although they both use RNA. And so that's a real easy distinction that can be made there. And that's the second letter, typically, is uh, is either like an L for line or a G or C for a uh, Gypsy or Copia, which are the two major families of LTR retrotransposons. So it's very much hierarchical, and you can get down into the nitty gritty because after these three letter codes, you can add a number. Um, so people have created these systems for hierarchically classifying transposable elements, but that can get difficult because you might have a DTM43 DNA that encodes a transposase that's a mutator type and it's number 43 but we also know that as you know mutr or something that we've given a, a common name to uh and that's been around in the literature for a long time so now all of a sudden the transposon has two na two names one that's you know interesting and the other one that's a coded name so you mentioned before the association between lines and autonomous transposons. What is the exact relationship? Are all autonomous transposons lines and are all lines autonomous transposons? No. Autonomous transposons can be DNA transposons as well if they encode all the proteins that they require uh, to jump themselves. So that's the definition of autonomous. Lines is just one kind, a uh, specific kind of transposable elements, and most of them are uh, autonomous. Yeah, in, in lines, there are specific subfamilies of lines that we know now are, are highly active, and there's lots of other. I mean, I can't I can't stress the fact in, as much that 99% of the transposable elements that you probably find in any eukaryotic genome are likely going to be mutated or derivatives or fragmented elements, and it, you get the the long full length autonomous element somewhat rarely. Now, in some cases where particular genomes are going under a burst of transposable element activity. And we have examples of that. You'll find more active autonomous elements. But transposition is so messy that you have all of these fragments in the genome. And because most genomes don't have very tight constraints on their genome size, that they're allowed just to essentially be part of the genome and be carried forward, even though it's a broke down, you know, old junkyard uh, piece of, of transposable element. You brought up this notion of being active, and active transposons is one that has a chance to uh, transpose somewhere else or jump somewhere else. What differentiates active from inactive ones? Is that just uh, they get damaged in the process and become inactive, but all the intact ones are all active? Uh, no. Uh, so even the intact ones can be silent. 
So the thing is the autonomous transposable elements that have the capability to jump by themselves, but that does not necessarily mean that the cell allows them to jump. Uh, as I was talking about those silencing mechanisms earlier, uh, they can be in place specifically restricting these uh, uh, autonomous transposable elements from jumping. And it's the same thing with the non-autonomous transposable elements. I mean, if the autonomous transposable elements does not express themselves, make those proteins required for transposition, the non-autonomous transposable elements cannot jump. And so actually one of the recent publications that we've had a couple of uh, years back, um, we hypothesized that there are specific mechanism that, sep that separately act on the autonomous and the non-autonomous ones, because somewhere the cell might recognize that as long as it acts on these autonomous transposable elements, it, it has a pretty good chance of shutting down the uh, transposable elements from expressing. Oh, that's pretty cool. But um, once this autonomous transposon escapes these controls by the cell and uh, manages to, to be transcribed, is that the case that it can lead not just to one new instance, one new copy, but as you, I think, said before, like a burst, like there, there could be a hundred more copies suddenly uh, appearing in, in the genome? Yes, the, 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 the evolutionary history. So when we look at a genome today, even though that might not have active transposable elements, we can see evidence of uh, punctuated activity of transposable elements, which we call transposable element bursts. And people have devised all sorts of very interesting tools to date when that happened. How long ago did this burst occur? There's two types of ways that can occur. One, which is more mysterious, is that suddenly an existing element within a genome can activate, let's say, get a new weapon in that evolutionary arms race and now defeat the host silencing and now go under a burst of activity. And this can massively expand a genome in, in size uh, and it can produce many copies of itself, all of which themselves can be active. Or you can have a transposable element, and there's examples of this, that's horizontally transferred. So it was never in that genome. So the genome doesn't have a defense against it, but it was uh, part of DNA moving from one organism to another and not often not highly related organisms. The, the example I'll bring up is the, the little brown bat genome, which is a, is a mammal, um, carries a transposable element that has massively amplified in its genome. But looking at other bats or other mammals, nobody could understand where that came from. Uh, and uh, we now think that that comes from the insect kingdom, probably through uh, a parasitic mite or, or some sort of uh, flea or tick that um, uh, that was uh, uh, in a close proximity to the bat. So Keith, and uh, you said you also study or studied uh, plants and mm -hmm. plants are famous for having a large uh, genome. So does that have anything to do with uh, transposons? Yeah, absolutely. Some plants have very large genomes, often our crops and the plants we're most interested in um, agriculturally have large genomes. And that's uh, really, there's two consequences, there's two reasons what, how a large genome can happen and they're both at play here. One is transposable element activity. So in the case of the maize genome, for example, which has a large genome, uh, there's been a lot of transposable element activity, particularly from LTR retrotransposons that have massively expanded the size of the, size of the genome. And the other mechanism is, uh, is if you duplicate uh, genomes and you have more than one set of chromosomes in that genome. So that's the case, for example, with the wheat genome. And the wheat genome is a hexaploid. And in, in agricultural plants, there's been this not purposeful selection on large genomes because when we have more genome content, we know that um, the cells are larger and that then translates to a larger product yield of the plant. So in the case of strawberry, the wild strawberry is a diploid organism, but people over the years, sometimes knowingly and sometimes unknowingly, were selecting for larger fruit, larger yield in it for Wheat, the same is true. And so they selected for duplications of chromosomes and of whole genomes, which produced larger fruit. So the current uh, supermarket strawberry that you would find is an octoploid. It's got four sets of, of two chromosomes. So in plant genomes, particularly agricultural plants, there's been almost a, an accidental selection for uh, large genomes. And the way you get a large genome is you either duplicate whole chromosomes or fractions of chromosomes, or you um, uh, cross hybridize with another plant and, and get um, 
multiple sets of chromosomes or you uh, massively uh, activate transposable elements. And often these are non-mutually exclusive. These all go on at the same time. Oh, that's very interesting. But uh, it's not the case, right, that simply having a large genome somehow causes bigger cells. It's probably the other way around that bigger cells allow a presence of a bigger genome. Yeah, that that, that could absolutely. I mean, we, we, we know that there's a distinct correlation between if we start doubling genomes, so we have a tool in which we can let the the, the nuclear, uh, the nucleus, I should say, uh, go through cell division, but use a drug that doesn't let cytokinesis happen. So essentially, you can double pairs of chromosomes. And we know that there's a correlation between how many chromosomes are in that nucleus and the final cell size. It, it might be cause or effect, but nonetheless, it's um, something that uh, has been unintentionally selected for just looking for larger yield for, you know, thousands of years. Wheat is the perfect example. Wheat is a, a hexaploid compared to its normal diploid uh, ancestors. So we talked about lines. Let's now move to their shorter counterparts, the signs. First of all, where's the threshold that delineates lines from signs? Oh, they're very different. The only thing that really ties them together is that lines are the autonomous transposable element responsible for mobilizing signs. But sequence-wise, they're distinct. Really, you can have lines can have two different types of non-autonomous elements. You can have the broken, fragmented line elements themselves, or you can have the completely distinct sign elements. Um, and sign elements have been very active in the human lineage, and there's uh, lots and lots of copies of them in uh, the human genome. I made a mistake once uh, in an experiment and made a, uh, a probe for a southern blot that had a sign on it. And uh, I knew something was wrong because the, the radiation level coming off the final southern blot was way, way too high. And then when I imaged it, it was, it was gorgeous, but I clearly picked up something that was there in a lot more copy numbers than the actual gene that I was going for. Yeah. Isn't that ironic that you would have benefited from masking away repetitive DNA? Yeah. I mean, this is the, absolutely. So, you know, if, if you were to, uh, you think about amplifying a gene or something like that, but often if you're amplifying the, the DNA or you're, you're amplifying the introns too, or, or, or um, the UTRs or something, and uh, oftentimes there's a little element in there that will mess with your experiment. Uh, and, and, and because of the copy number will be that signal will be amplified way greater than the signal from the gene that you're intending to uh, to use in that particular experiment. And the same thing happens bioinformatically, where you could say, hey, wow, this gene is expressed so high, it has a uh, hundred or, or thousands of reads uh, coming from it uh, uh, in RNA-seq. But, and then you look closer and they're all mapping to the UTR where there's a repetitive element that's super hot in, in that particular sample. And it's not the gene itself, but uh, you've gotten, you know, your wires crossed as far as, uh, as, as uh, 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 informatically, they can really mess with uh, experiments. One of the, uh, probably the most popular uh, repeat in the sign family is LU. What differentiates it from other uh, repeats? Is that, is that the case that all LUs have the same origin and what are they famous for? Uh, ALU is the retrotransposon that morphed with a tRNA molecule, is the best way I can put it, uh, which is a pol 3 transcribed uh, product. And now you have a particular small non-autonomous element of an active uh, family, the, the lines, that was incredibly um, productive and efficient in duplicating itself to all regions of the genome. So the reason signs have, outside the transposable element community, the reason signs have been picked up by everyone is that if you're studying a human gene, and it really doesn't matter which human gene, uh, because of the numbers, you will probably have signs around or in your gene. And so when people go to study at great detail their particular gene, they end up talking about, well, what's this sign doing? Is this sign responsible for the regulation? Because essentially they're all over the place. Okay. And the other thing you mentioned was LTR. 
right? Or uh, long terminal repeats. Uh, what are they? This is a family separate from signs and lines, right? Absolutely. It's the other type of retrotransposon. And these are the ones that are really dominate uh, plant genomes. So uh, human genomes would be dominated by lines and signs and plant genomes are dominated by LTR retrotransposons and their fragmented derivatives. Uh, so these are retrotransposons that encode GAG, which creates a structural capsid, and pole, which is a reverse transcriptase um, to, to copy the RNA back into the DNA. And there can be other coding regions in there as well. But that's essentially the, the key components. And it uses, um, again, tRNAs and a, uh, a very complex mechanism to copy itself it never copies itself and it's not it's not the simple way you're probably thinking where it makes one long rna copy and then reverse transcribes that instead it makes it's a very convoluted process by which it makes a, a transcript that self primes itself but nevertheless it ends up um integrating into dna and essentially at that moment of integration reverse transcribing itself back into the dna as a dna copy and and what's interesting about these is most of them have really selectively for insertion target other transposable elements or other repetitive regions of the genome. So they tend to create what we call a nested configuration where it's transposable element inserted into other transposable elements and so on. So it creates this this, this stacking doll metaphor of, of transposable element nesting. So when you look at complex repetitive regions, you often see this jumbled nested configuration of transposable elements, which is very difficult from an annotation or, or even assembly point of view to, to deal with in genomes. And I think the irony there is that uh, when one uh, repeat inserts itself into the other repeat, that makes it less of a repeat, right? It's, it gives it some unique flair. It does give it some uh, unique flair, and it might actually it might also hamper the possibility of the uh, previous uh, repeat to be properly transposed uh, and and things like that. Yeah, cannibalization. And uh, another instance of this repeats within repeats are these, um, as you mentioned, uh, inverted repeats, right at the ends of the um, retrotransposons. So what what purpose do they serve? Right. So. DNA transposons actually have inverted repeats at the end, and these are it's the okay. it's the same sequence from anywhere from typically eight to three hundred nucleotides in length. That's the same sequence on both sides of the transposable element. It's just inverted, uh, flipped around, uh, and, and not in what we call a direct orientation, where they head the same way. And so this these are great because they help us define the borders of a transposable element. If you can find both of those. And they act in the case of a DNA transposon as the binding site for the transposase protein, which the autonomous element produces. The autonomous element will grab onto these binding sites and uh, cut there, very similar to what, how a restriction enzyme cuts and use, using a staggered cut, and uh, then pick up the transposable element and go insert it somewhere else in the genome and, and therefore mobilize that transposable element. Uh, LTR retrotransposons, and that LTR stands for long terminal repeat, they have um, longer <laughs> repeats at their termini, and those are in a direct configuration, meaning they both point the same direction, and uh, they are necessary for the mechanism of retrotransposition. So you really can't have a functional LTR retrotransposon without those repeats. They're, they're structurally necessary for the process in both cases. So I think of them as often as the Achilles heel of the transposable element. One, it really helps the cell define what is a transposable element to know what to silence. And two, it really helps us identify transposable elements that can't go too much into stealth mode because of these repeats. There are some transposable elements like helitrons, which, which are a special type of DNA transposon that don't have these repeat, and because of that, they are way more difficult to identify within the genome and still give people fits with, you know, they think they're studying a gene, but it's just a fragment of a helitron. So since those uh, terminal repeats act as the target's sort of restriction sites, wouldn't that mean almost by definition that once uh, this thing is reinserted, those terminal repeats would be damaged because the transposase is cut? In, inside it. And so it won't be able to reproduce anymore? So the cut is actually right outside the inverted repeats in the case of a DNA transposon, right in the flanking DNA. And 
what happens is if you make a staggered cut and then you insert the transposable element somewhere else, the inserting DNA is not is not um, uh, blunt or not flush at the end. It's staggered. It's an overhang. So when that goes into the new piece of DNA, there's a couple nucleotides there that have to be filled in. And what that does is it creates what's called a target site duplication on either side of the transposable element, which is this often, it, it's different for different transposable elements, but let's just say eight nucleotide kind of duplicated restriction site that was once one site and now is two sites right on the flanks of a transposable element. So if you want to know, is this a really bona fide recent transposition event, you can look for a target site duplication. And if you can identify it, yes, that is that just uh, basically happened in evolutionary time. That's really recent. How can you tell a terminal repeat from this uh, target site duplication? Is one sort of transitioning into the other? At the end. Yeah, I mean, the terminal repeats uh, will be shared among the transposable elements of that family. So those will be highly repetitive. The target site, du site duplication is not repetitive. It is a, a region of the insertion site DNA that's simply been duplicated on either side. But, but if you look genome-wide, that piece of DNA will not be repetitive in, in this family of transposable elements. It's a very fine distinction. It's a very small distinction, but informatically, that's actually very easy. And, and so the other question is, if transposase cuts out this um, element and inserts elsewhere, that's not really copying, right? That's just uh, moving. Oh, that, yes. Uh, that is called what we call cut and paste. But here's what happens. And this is this is wild, but people figured this out. Um, uh, people figured this out, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So if you have a DNA that is post-replication phase, so you essentially have sister chromatids in, in a chromosome that looks like an X, and the transposable element is cut out, the excision site, the site in which it was cut out for them, can you, it, can, it can just ligate blunt right together, then you have a true excision. But if it's after S phase, you have an exact copy right there to do homology directed repair from. So it can look to the other sister chromatid, which still has the transposable element at that position, and copy the DNA from there to fill in the gap. So essentially what you're left with is, yes, it cut and pasted, and then at the cut site, it copied from the sister chromatid to refill the space. And, and I should say that, you know, that, that that's figured out by by McClintock and, and her uh, predecessor, or, or the people that were in her lab afterwards, her trainees, with with just an incredible eye for genetics um, and uh, not not what we consider the molecular biology toolbox that we have now. Yeah. And McClintock was uh, given a Nobel Prize, wasn't she? Yeah. Uh, McClintock, I should say, <laughs> McClintock is, is the hero of the transposable element world. Like everybody has, you know, their knight in shining armor and, and, and McClintock is it for our world. And her attention to detail is, is incredible. And her career... Probably she could have been awarded two Nobel Prizes uh, on totally separate topics. Um, she was awarded the Nobel Prize from work that initiated in the in the early 1950s, but she was awarded that in uh, 83 or 84, long after the discovery. Yeah, and, and there's some great stories. With you know, I, I never personally met her, but I trained with someone as a postdoc that that worked closely with her. And there's um, these stories are are stuff of legend in the transposable element community. I think uh, I've read somewhere that uh, the reason why uh, she was given the Nobel Prize so late uh, was that because she was basically wrong about these repeats for a long time. Like she called them control controlling elements, and uh, and she ascribed them the the functions that they mostly didn't possess. I think. Well. In her system, they did have those functions, but that those functions were specific to her system. And now, now, I mean. You're generally right. There, there's a number of reasons why I think McClintock was overlooked for so long. I think absolutely gender has something to do with that. This was not a time there was many women in science, and, and she, she was not a very straightforward writer. What she wrote is very dense and difficult to get at. Then she became frustrated with the system and often was publishing her findings in newsletters and not in, in the journals of the day, where she was allowed to have the space to go on about what, what she was uh, researching. And then people simply saw them as, as junk for a number of years and didn't see them uh, as controlling elements. But we now know there's um, 
many examples, particularly in high repeat content genomes like maize in which he was studying, that transposable elements often are controlling nearby genes, where, where, or at least influencing the expression of that nearby gene, where a transposable element, especially a non-autonomous element, you can think of it as just a protein binding beacon. And if that non-autonomous element is near a gene, it's going to bring in new proteins, and those proteins can affect either positively or negatively the level of, of, of transcription or regulation of that particular genes that can act as essentially enhancers or repressors. So, uh, so, so McClintock, the idea of controlling elements, not every transposable element is a controlling element. In fact, most of them have no ability to control anything. However, there are absolutely examples where they control uh, quite, a, quite a lot of development. Most of the uh, families that we've discussed so far, the signs, the lines, the, the uh, LTRs, um, these are all uh, retrotransposons, right? So um, why it, it seems like retrotransposons are more popular, at least in humans, than uh, uh, DNA transposons. Uh, why is that the case? One of the cases you can assume is the fact that just now you guys discussed about the DNA transposons and they have to be at a very specific developmental time uh, so that they can make multiple copies of themselves. Whereas for retrotransposons, no matter when they make a copy, they can insert it anywhere and make multiple um, copies of them. And also the fact, this is just a side note, the fact that there are uh, almost no active DNA transposable elements in, in humans. If they were active, then there will be more examples of transposition and sort of this burst, but that we don't see that in humans. Yeah, there are organisms in which, you know, McClintock originally discovered DNA transposons and DNA transposons, they're incredibly interesting and their regulation is incredibly complex, but they're not in volume the same level as uh, as the retrotransposons, whether in plant genomes with the LTR retrotransposons or in uh, in animal genomes with the the lines and signs. So, if you really want to discuss the the problems that repetitive DNA create, that's greatest with the retrotransposons and not with the DNA transposons. I should say that for the most part, though, DNA transposons are, are usually more mutagenic, in the sense that when they're active. Um, which is a big asterisk, you know, that, that might not happen often. But when they are, there's lots of DNA transposons that seem to specifically target genes for insertion, particularly the five prime or promoter regions of genes. And uh, that's a particular place where if you have an insertion, it's going to cause a frame shift or cause a early terminated transcript and create, create a mutation. So those retrotransposons, which I mentioned oft, often like to transpose into other repetitive regions of the genome, transposition itself might not cause a big mutation there. But if you start transposing into genes, you do. And that's where the famous mutator family of transposable elements comes from, or mu. Mutator is just because of the incredibly high mutation rate uh, a gentleman named Don Robertson uh, originally identified in a, in a line of, uh, of corn plants that was coming from this DNA transposon family that was very specifically transposing into and mutating genes. So I, I just wonder if the DNA transposons can be more harmful or more mutagenic, and so there's a higher chance of them being selected out of the population, and that's why you have more retrotransposons remaining in the population. Yeah, uh, I mean, there, there's the potential that they would be under um, a higher degree of pressure for silencing than the LTR retrotransposons, yeah. for example. Yeah. And uh, then there are the repeats that are not transposable elements, right? So one example is, uh, I think, tandem repeats. So what, what are tandem repeats and uh, how do they reproduce or, or do they? T tandem repeats is a, is a broad category, but tandem repeats is the idea is that you have a, a piece of DNA, not a transposable element, but it could be a genic fragment, it can be an intergenic fragment, it really doesn't matter, but that it, it becomes duplicated right next to itself. So these are not dispersed repeats like transposable elements often are, but these are um, uh, in cis or, or right next to each other, um, local, and it gets duplicated and they point the same way. It's not an inverted repeat, it's a direct repeat. And these tandem repeats, if it duplicates and now it's there, there's a number of there's two of them in a row. Um, this can often lead to an array of hundreds in a row um, of the same sequence. Let's maybe it's 200 nucleotides long, 200 base pairs long, and it's over and over and over again 
right next to each other, all in the same direction. And these tandem repeats are, are thought to occur in the process of DNA replication, essentially by slipping of the polymerase. And the polymerase goes back and reads the same region a whole bunch of times and produces this array of, of repeats. And the interesting thing about them is they happen very they happen and they disappear very quickly on evolutionary terms. So in evolutionary time. So uh, you might have two individuals of the same species, but that are from different areas of the world. And they have a very different, they have the tandem repeats, but in, in, in one case, there's three copies of the uh, three in a row. And in another case, there's a hundred. And so they evolve much faster than genes. So people have used them as markers because it's very easy to uh, at, determine how large the array is. And uh, and it, it's rapidly evolving. So they can use them as polymorphisms in, uh, in experiments that have been very useful for, for, for mapping uh, disease or, or traits. Right. And, and then there are uh, I think they're called simple repeats or just low complexity regions, which is like maybe the same letter or the same couple of letter repeated many times over. Is that the same mechanism? Yeah, these are regions that there are low complexity regions of the genome that um, that can happen from a number of different mechanisms. There's uh, mechanisms we understand in which a poly A tail, which just reads A, 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 can be reinserted back into the genome. Um, and, uh, and that leads to a region that's difficult to deal with, uh, by sequence, by assembly or by annotation. And, and there's, that could happen multiple times in the same genome. So now that's repetitive within that genome. Uh, there are cases, whether it's, uh, ATs or AGs, where there's long arrays of just the same two letters over and over again, which is probably I mean, one way to think about it is it's the same thing as a as a direct repeat or a tandem repeat that we just discussed, but it's on a much much smaller level where the the size of the tandem repeat is is two nucleotides in that case, uh, and it's thought to happen by very similar mechanisms. Um, these are these are very difficult regions to deal with in the genome um, on a on an informatic uh, point of view because uh, a, a lot of times um, they they simply will be either masked or the reads. Uh, uh, won't be efficiently uh, aligned to those regions of the genome, or, or the reads before they are even be, before alignment. The reads are tossed out because the reads itself are, are, are a simple sequence, so it's considered an, an error of sequencing. Well, let's not talk about your paper case. That's called the case for not masking away repetitive DNA. Yeah, you can call it a paper. I call it a rant. Right? I, <laughs> I got. Uh, I got annoyed with a particular set of papers that was that came out that co was completely obviously ignoring the repetitive fraction and I could uh, account for what these people well, what these papers were seeing um if I just uh very simply um didn't mask away the the, the genome and so you know that anger translated into my fingers moving and in about a day or two I had written um this off and just on a whim, just boom, here, take it into the journal Mobile DNA. Yeah, so now it's a peer-reviewed rant. <laughs> that's right. And now it's a, um, it's like that moment that you might not be proud of that's captured forever <laughs> in the literature. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, I guess I was on a, a kind of a tear that day. But I'm usually not, not that uh, opinionated about, you know, how people want to approach their different experiments. But this was a case where it's like, well, gosh, there should be some information that everyone knows about repetitive DNA. Yeah, and uh, it, it has a very specific purpose, which I think you, you state in, in that note, which you say, like, I hope when people Google how to mask repeats, they will discover this article. And that's exactly what happened to me. So um, it, it definitely works uh, in that way. Awesome. Can you tell a bit more about that case? Uh, like when people were could, could not explain something because they were masking uh, repetitive DNA? Right. This often happens in our field or in biology in general that people are running a standard pipeline uh, of analysis and somewhere in that uh, analysis there's what's called like a rep base or rep or uh, some sort of repeat based uh, filtering that goes on and what they're doing is they're trying to obviously simplify their results and focus on the genes of the organism but to focus on the genes they've excluded uh, the majority of the genome. And often they're looking at those genes, but they're failing to understand why the genes are regulated the way they are because they're not considering things like, 
introns or UTRs or promoters because they're chock full of these repetitive fragments. People can identify these trends uh, in their data and, and even publish on them that as soon as you redo the analysis, but undo their filter, take away that filter of the repetitive region of the genome, it, you see it in a very different light. And in this case, you can see that the conclusion of the paper was A leads to B. And in reality, you see it as as something completely different, that A does not lead to B, but this is all uh, a consequence of a very specific view of the genome and your data that was taken. Yeah, so I think as humans, we tend to view everything in this dichotomous discrete categories, like this is a sign, and uh, sign meaning the S-I-N-E, the uh, short interspersed nuclear element. Um, and so this is a sign, and this is a uh, an enhancer, right? And so we we don't usually imagine that they could be the same thing, but of course, science is part of the genome. They could be co-opted into into this evolution and could become enhancers and whatnot. I absolutely agree. There's this 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 need in our brains to categorize and catalog things, and uh, and I think the transposable element community generally we've collected a lot of people that that love the things that destroy that right. Like I I, I like studying dogma. Uh, crushing um, theories and and dogma crushing ideas of look there's there's an element that's kind of it's not a sign or it's uh, it's kind of a combination of these two things and therefore our classification system to some extent falls apart and um, you know we've collected people like that in the transposable element community and uh, and I think you know it might not be helpful but we've created a very difficult situation for people outside the community to try to understand uh, what exactly is going on. Why is that difficult? Well, they want, I often get contacted, what's the program I should use? <laughs> and it's like, oh, oh man, <laughs> there's a, there's a pages and pages of these programs. So you have to get very specific of exactly what do you want. And often these people uh, don't, haven't really thought ex on a specific level what exactly they want. The analysis to do so then i'll we'll say well okay well here's the options and there's eight different options and they all have different dependencies or different variables that can be considered um and and we'll i'll make it complicated and that's that's probably deterring them from doing the analysis where um you know if there was one grand program to rule them all to to to, to let's say annotate transposable elements in a genome then a lot more people would do it but would you look at the available programs it's a it's a spider's web of uh of all these different people reinventing tools and building tools on other people's and it takes expertise to do it's not just a click and you know run this one little tool and you're done so you argue against these people who mask away the repeats but clearly your position is not that they should just do nothing about the repeats, right? Because you are talking about like various programs to annotate the repeats. So what is your approach that you advocate that is somewhere between ignoring the repeats and masking them away? Well, if you happen to be in an organism that's well-studied, model organism, uh, a crop species, uh, human, the number one thing I can say is go go find the official annotated transposable element, you know, annotation of that genome. It's uh, much easier than producing that yourself. And if every single person or research group annotates their own elements, the problem is, is they might not put make those publicly available. And essentially, everybody's analyzing a different set of elements. And that, that gets really difficult to deal with. So, you know, obviously, there's not an official genome annotation for every genome that's currently being done. There's lots of genomes that come out almost on a daily basis now. But if you're in human, mouse, uh, Drosophila, C. elegans, zebrafish, uh, Arabidopsis, and many in the plant world, many of these have had major genome projects to annotate the transposable elements. And I'm not saying by any means that those are perfect, but at least we can work on a common set. And so it's not different between each and individual analysis. Right. So let's say you are working on, on, on a human or a, or a mouse and uh, and you have these annotation tracks. But um, the, the natural inclination then, since, since I have these tracks, I'll just use them to mask the repeats away, right? But you are arguing for, for something else. So 
what in your view should I be doing to my repeats if not mask them, but still take these tracks into account somehow? Yes, if, if you have uh, sequencing reads available, try and map them to those repeats. Uh, many of the repeats have the polymorphism so that given a long enough read, you should be able to assign a specific read to a specific locus. It doesn't always have to be uh, repetitive. There is There are different subfamilies. There has been different uh, uh, diversity between uh, the transposable elements or the different repeat family so that you can say which read comes from where. And even if they don't, then there are consensus elements available or you can map them to a family and not individual elements and then can assay if a specific family is affecting uh, the genes nearby it or, uh, or, or overall regulation sort of thing. So you don't have to uh, turn a blind eye to these repeats, but you can do some sort of uh, analysis to see if they have an impact on whatever it is that you're studying. So if we're talking simply about read mapping, right, you, you could just yeah. map the reads onto the genome and the genome itself will contain, among others, these repetitive sequences. And if, as you say, they're distinct enough to allow read mapping, then the reads will, will be mapped, right? So I, I don't see how having separate tracks for uh, repeats would help here. It's not a separate track. Uh, it's just the annotations are done uh, differently. There are a lot of different classifications of the transposable elements based on families and mechanisms. And so these are just annotations. They just say where in the genome they are. Right. So, so, I'm, so I'm just asking, like, what would you use that for? If if your subject is not directly related to repetitive DNA, right, if you're looking for just general regulatory sequences, you're you're saying I should use these repeat annotations, in what way should I use them? Like instead of just discovering uh, regulatory sequences de novo, regardless of whether they are inside repeats or not inside repeats, uh, just being completely agnostic, you're saying I should look also whether those are repeats just to know that they are repeats or what was the angle here? Well, well, let, let's use a very specific uh, example that might help illustrate what we're talking about. So if you had a, a gene that you were interested in and you examined the, let's say, transcriptome in a two different, you know, in, in wild type and mutant, just to make it simple, there's multiple location, multiple times in that pipeline that, that people will filter away either the reads itself or mask the DNA that that in which the read mapped to uh, of the repetitive DNA. So there could you could look at a gene and say, look, the, there's, the counts are identical across the gene, uh, so there's, there's no difference here. Or there could be a case in which you have a, a transposable element in the promoter, and the transposable element has uh, a number of reads, whether they be uniquely mapping or whether they be multiple mapping, to that transposable element in the promoter, and that might correlate with some effect that you're seeing. So if you're not even willing to see that because either you filtered away the reads or you've masked the regions of the genome so the reads won't display if they map there or uh, won't even map there, then uh, then you're not looking at the full promoter. You're looking at, let's say, 90% of the promoter. Right. But if, if I just did nothing, right, if I didn't mask away the repeats, but I also didn't use any specific repeat annotations, I, I just did nothing. I just used this stock uh, genome assembly that contains all the repetitive regions right there. Would that be correct, you think? Or should I do something extra to accommodate the repeats? If you, if you didn't annotate the genome and just mapped everything, it depends how you handle your multi-mapping reads. Essentially, what you're going to be looking at as interesting is all the repeats. I mean, if you're, for example, if you're mapping small RNAs uh, and you're uh, not going to annotate the genome, then basically you're just looking at where the transposable elements are in the genome, mm. because those those will, spe you know, all very specifically map there. And you're not going to see sometimes these other interesting things that are happening with genes or something. So the annotation can tell you, oh, I, I'm expecting this peak. It's predicted from the literature, essentially, that these are small RNA generating areas. And, and I don't need to focus my analysis on what the heck is this thing, right? So the understanding how the repeats, you know, relate to a specific gene, I think, is, um, is, is where the annotation comes in. You need to know essentially a couple of things. You need to know where the repeats are uh, on that genome track, for example, and you need to understand how the reads were mapped. Because if, if you're going to say, I only want 100% uniquely mapping reads 
in the genome, then essentially you've said, I don't want repetitive DNA to be mapped. Ah, that's, that's a good point. So you're essentially masking away the repeats without explicitly acknowledging it just by setting the threshold. Correct. Except in the examples where maybe there's a, a snipper, a polymorphism yeah. that lets you uniquely map something. So now you're massively underestimating and you're throwing away probably a huge amount of the sequencing reads. Um, the second, if you decide, for example, to map all. So any read, you know, if, if something multi maps, map it um, each and every time to the genome. Uh, well, that's going to massively amplify the number of, um, you know, if you have reads in, a, in whatever experiment this is to an ALU element, that's going to massively duplicate that number, uh, that read over a number of different times. So if you're looking only at a specific chromosomal locus, you know, a one gene, then uh, then you might want to do that because those reads do exist. But if you're looking at a genome wide level, that's um, that's going to all you're going to see basically in the genome is the ALU elements and, and lines. So, so there's understanding how the reads were handled and how the repetitive DNA was handled. I would say is 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 just as important to be upfront about that uh, and understand the assumptions that were made and the outcomes that that those assumptions will lead to uh, than than actually considering the repetitive DNA. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I think the RNAC community is much better ab about this because th they have, for example, our Sam or Callisto. Th they do this um, expectation maximization to reassign reads to different transcripts according to the evidence. So they won't get this uh, case where either everything is ignored or everything is amplified. But for example, with the uh, CheapSeq, I don't think they have anything like that so you're you're essentially using like a stock read mapping software and uh, the options aren't as great there i think yeah that's right you know for for something like rna seq molly hamill at cold spring harbor created i think i believe it's called te toolkit and it's a, a program that is essentially doing something very similar to DEseq2 for differential expression analysis and you can use it for mrna seq or you could use it for um for RNA-seq, sorry, or you could use it for something like ChIP-seq for peak calling. And, and it's specifically looking statistically at the regulation of the transposable elements in that genome. So there's a couple different assumptions that probably should be made between the transposable elements compared to just doing a standard DE-seq analysis uh, that you would do for the genes because of the repetitive nature. So uh, that's a very useful toolkit uh, that, I, that I highly recommend that my lab has used to look at uh, RNA-seq. Yeah, what what I don't quite like about this approach is that you either ignore repeats altogether, or if not, you have to almost become, you know, like yourselves. You have to become yes. a researcher in this field of yes. repeated DNA and transposable elements. That's what I was talking about. That's our problem in the community yeah. that we've done this, right? We've we've we have a community of very smart people that has worked really hard that there's not a lot of consensus in, and so we've created lots of different tools and lots of different approaches. And typically, the gene centric researchers that come to us, they want you know what's the one thing I, I don't want to ignore these, but I also don't want to spend a month on these. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. So that that's I've uh, you know I've written in up in the past a little paragraph or something or, or you know these are our go-to tools for your initial analysis but a lot of that also kind of depends on what genome you're in and how repetitive and what type those repeats are but but I, I think um you know without excluding some of these great programs that people have built i think there are um some really useful uh tools um out there uh repeat masker repit these are things that have been really uh, adopted by a, a number of different non-transposable element type labs as either individual tools or pipelines that I think is way better than doing nothing. Yeah, speaking of uh, repeat masker, there's this interesting thing. If you download uh, the stock human genome, then if you if you actually look at the FASTA file of the sequence, then uh, the repetitive regions are already soft masks. So the non-repetitive are in uppercase ACTG and the repetitive ones are in uh, lowercase. But to be honest, I never quite figured what to do with it. Like, are there any <laughs> programs that take the case into account, do you know? Oh, uh, I don't think so. I've never, I've never heard of a program that took the, the case into consideration. The, the, sta the stock genome that I work with all the time also does the exact same thing. And in fact, any intergenic DNA, 
um, they they have as lowercase. And then when you get to the genes, it was like, hey, this is important. We'll we'll capitalize this. But yeah, I think there's better things we can go find in the genome besides caps lock. And uh, do these arguments that you shouldn't be masking the repeats, do they also apply to these low complexity regions? Like if there's a couple letters repeated hundreds of times over, do you think there's still some signal in those regions as well? Yeah, I, I, this is my personal view, but I tend to think at some point the whole genome gets transcribed, you know, and there's, there's, there's going to be reads in an RNA-seq experiment or there, there's going to be, maybe not polydentylated, but, uh, but those reads, a lot of those reads actually never even make it to the filtering step because they've been excluded earlier on in the pipeline. Um, so those are particularly difficult regions to uh, to cover because it's a common sequence error to spit out something like that. So they get hung up in um, in a not passing quality filter type pre filter before the genome is ever considered. I also asked for uh, questions on uh, Reddit on the R Bioinformatics subreddit, and uh, we've got uh, quite a few questions. So I'd like to go through them and. Uh, some of them are quite interesting. So the user Versipelis says, I spent some time during one of my rotations analyzing a highly repetitive gene in Volocrine. We always went with the philosophy, don't trust any of the submissions for this gene after 2005, since that's about when we expected to see Illumina submissions. And, so, and then the, the questions for you guys. Uh, do you think it's possible to overcome these repetition issues using only short read sequencing or do most of these highly repetitive regions require longer reads from PacBio? I don't personally trust Oxford Nanopore, but is it useful in decrypting these repetitive regions when paired with Illumina deep sequencing? What do you think? I, I think, um, first of all, in the question, I didn't really catch in the question when they were talking about submissions um, after a certain date, if they're talking about like genome assembly or assembly of the gene yeah, submissions sure or, or submissions of like annotations or submissions of uh, of uh, experimental like RNA-seq or something. But, you know, from, from a structural point of view, Illumina sequencing, the, the de novo genome assembly, so putting together a genome without a previous one to scaffold, is either very difficult or not suggested with the Illumina sequence. So they're just too simply too short. They're highly accurate and there's a lot of them, but they're very short. So uh, a lot of times what people have done with the Lumina reads is, is map them back to a scaffold to, to find uh, SNPs or, or small polymorphisms. And so if they're building something purely based on a Lumina reads um, and it's, you know, over a short distance and uh, not repetitive within itself, then there's a chance they could assemble it with Illumina reads. But I think, um, you know, the hope is that either through Illumina and longer reads and paired end reads and different approaches through Illumina or with the, the, the PacBio or uh, Oxford Nanopore, that this is going to be a lot simpler to put it together as a full piece. And even with a higher error rate in sequencing, it typically can fit together much easier in one or two pieces than in, you know, hundreds with, with Illumina. But as in any sequencing strategy, mixing these approaches uh, gives you the best of kind of two different worlds. Yeah. And what do you think about Oxford Nanopore? Because on, on the one hand, these are, of course, longer reads, but they have also this high insertion and, and deletion errors. And those are especially crucial in the repeats because then you, you could misdiagnose the, the length of the repeat. Uh, exactly. I think that's why uh, Keith was talking about mixing a couple different approaches. So uh, where they have the advantages of long reads, and then if you have short reads from Illumina, you can go back into those long reads and see where the uh, errors can be and trust uh, Illumina sequences, which have uh, less, uh, which are less error prone to so sort of uh, fill in those gaps or fix those gaps so that you can trust the overall uh, annotation or the sequence that you come up with. And then Versipelis asks another question. Is this problem uniquely eukaryotic? I mostly work with bacteria and viruses now, which is the Wild West in many ways. Do prokaryotes or viruses also have known examples of these highly repetitive regions? Has the age of Illumina led us to miss these in lower order organisms? 
the answer to the first question, do prokaryotes have repetitive DNA and transposable elements? The answer is a clear yes. There are uh, types of transposable elements in prokaryotics called insertion sequences or IS elements uh, that are in bacterial chromosomes and then as well can transpose into, uh, into plasmid material and can, can transpose outside the chromosome as well. Um, so this is not a purely eukaryotic problem. There are certainly fragments of repetitive DNA. I mean, um, CRISPR itself is a is a array of repetitive uh, DNA often uh, in prokaryotic genomes. That's what R stands for, isn't it? Right. So uh, I, I don't think this is a purely eukaryotic problem, but, but the problem is amplified or magnified thousands of fold in eukaryotes where you start to get these, instead of dis- what are called dispersed repeats, which they happen once in a while uh, in a genome, but they're not um, clustered. You get these clustered repeats that where it's like hundreds and hundreds of repeats clustered all together. Something like in eukaryotes, you get chromosomal knobs and you get pericentromeres, which is the flank of the of the centromere. And these are physically made out of transposable element sequences uh, so, so that you can have arrays of uh, huge distances um, that, that typically that does not happen in a prokaryotic genome. So it's, it's, it's still there. It's just uh, a lot bigger of a problem in much larger eukaryotic genomes. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. So if, if you have a smaller genome, you have a priori much less space to, for, for these repeats to occur. And also I think uh, bacteria are more efficient at uh, ditching this junk DNA. Oh, you, you probably object to, to me using the term junk DNA. No, you know, <laughs> you know, I've learned to live with junk DNA. <laughs> There's worse things uh, that you could say. But like, you know, junk DNA, even in the transposable element world, I would see this autonomous transposable element that is, you know, in a genome and as evidence of recent transposition and say, oh, that's, that's, that's a beautiful element. And then see this other fragmented element and be like, oh, that's a piece of junk. <laughs> um, so, so junk DNA, like, for me, I guess I just see you know, where someone else sees all junk, I see occasional pieces of treasure and then a lot more junk. <laughs> but there's so much of so many of these things in such a, a large volume that yeah, it's hard to look through one of these arrays and be like, yeah, this isn't anything except scrambled transposable element sequence. But, you know, prokaryotic genomes, they're under, uh, many of them, I should say, are under constraints for replication time. So they're under a uh, c- constraint to have a small genome. And so that will help get rid of DNA much faster than some eukaryotic genomes, which don't seem to have this constraint. And so the genome is allowed to get uh, obese and, and that obesity is often carried through transposable elements. Right. So, so maybe they are meaning uh, bacteria are in a better position to, to call it junk DNA because they are actually carrying the cost of it, whereas <laughs> it's more yeah. or less free for us. Yeah, yeah, well, unless, yeah, unless unless the transposition itself is uh, either causing chromosome breaks or or, or inserting into uh, genes or something like that, where just carrying a piece of DNA that's far away from a gene and not causing any effect is is not necessarily you know it's just a passenger at this point. It's not necessarily um, a detriment, and that's why you know our genome is the size and is the junk graveyard that it is, is because we're essentially carrying along so much of this. Uh, fragmented or part of our evolutionary history yeah i was also thinking it, it should be possible to estimate like the average growth rate of, of our genome i saw somewhere an estimate of an extra alu element per 20 births something like oh. that so it should, should be possible yeah. to estimate like how many base pairs per generation we, we acquire yes absolutely i mean there are absolutely mechanisms of dna loss as well but uh, yeah, it's a it's a dynamic equation. You know, there's also active uh, line elements, the autonomous versions um, in human populations, uh, which are often called SVAs. So those elements um, themselves also that you could calculate. I haven't seen the number, but how many how many elements per human birth or something like that? It's uh, you you could do that calculation. I, I don't know of it offhand that someone's done it. Uh, user Oloaptasis says, I'm currently working on repeats and what frustrates me is that a lot of papers would reference repeat databases and use them for their analysis. However, after their analysis, they would not submit their repeat libraries to any database. Am I wrong in my thinking that they should upload somewhere their repeat libraries? Or is there a, a, a reason why people do not do this? And I think this uh, this references 
what you said about like everyone doing their own repeat annotation, right? So, so here we're talking probably not about like well annotated more organisms, but some uh, more exotic organisms. I think uh, we are of the opinion that if they're referencing an already publicly available repeat database uh, and it's available to everyone, that's fine. But if they actually did the annotation themselves and created these databases, they should absolutely be available uh, for everyone else's use. And if they're not, I, I, I think at least if people request to the authors this list of databases, that they should make it available. There's absolutely no reason not to. Yeah, and... and... And I mean, I think we're dealing in a case here, which is, is probably an organism which does not have its own repeat annotation already on like rep based repository, which I know rep based a lot of people um, have complained that it's 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 typically opened for academics, but is uh, behind a paywall for for people in industry. So there's a difference in uh, availability in this case uh, of those data sets and any kind of informatic file or database that was used as a, as a halfway point. I know there's a big push now to to not only publish the raw data and the results of a, let's say, an RNA-seq experiment, but also but also put on, on NCBI Geo, like that the SAM or BAM file that that was uh that that was the in-between file between the raw data and the results. So people can know that if they're if they're using the same raw data but not getting the same result, then this is some sort of variable or uh, something that was taken into consideration during the mapping or, you know, this is the mapping set essentially that was used to create that, the final conclusion. So I think the same is true for, uh, for the, for these databases. Typically um, it's unfortunate that it's not publicly available, but I would very much hope once it was requested to the corresponding author that they made it publicly or that they at least shared it with the requester. Yeah. So what's the situation with wrap base? Uh, As you said, it's, it's free for academics, right? Uh, why is there no like completely free database? It's just not, no one bothered to do it. Well, I think, oh, geez, I, I think RepBase was was early to the game, and these were people in the transposable element field that really knew what they were doing uh, with annotation, and they created a database. And I, I, I don't know why it was um, given different access to to industry versus um, academics. But, uh, you know, now that academics have this, for them, open repository where they can, where there's annotation, transposable element an annotation information, it would be very hard to duplicate that somewhere else that's completely free and open for, for everyone because a lot of people in the field don't see the problem because it's free to them. Uh, and And it would be very difficult for to start, you know, kind of an industry only. So you'd get all, you can't expect these different companies to um, cooperate in the sense of sharing data between each other to, to submit their, their, their repository. So um, rep base is not perfect, but I see it as difficult to, to create these other repositories just as it's difficult. There's a couple different naming schemes for transposable elements out there. And it's just some people have adopted different ones and it's hard to, it's hard to tell academics, everybody do this as far as a standard. Occasionally it works, but um, often, you know, for some reason, people like different programs or people like different repositories. And so the information can be highly spread out. But again, this should all be able to be clarified through an email to the corresponding author and a request. And that person should either point uh, the requester to the publicly available file or provide that file to them. And if, if that's not happening, then that's not a breakdown of rep base. That's a breakdown of the agreement that the author signed when uh, he or she published the article in the first place. And there is a related question from uh, someone named Fedboy93. Can you ask them, uh, meaning you, about their uh, stance on modeling the repeats and annotating them rather than using rep base? which isn't really open and uh, uh, what other algorithms methodologies can be implemented in order to mine these repeats. Is it possible to create and maintain alternative repositories that can harbor this information? Something like RED, R-E-D, can be used. So th this is, I think, similar to, to my question of like, why is there no alternative database? There are a ton of programs out there that will help you uh, 
identify the repeats in, in genomes. And I think that a lot of uh, transposable elements or repeat uh, researchers uh, do those which are not very happy with the uh, quality of the annotation publicly available. So they do it themselves and for the specific families they're interested in or genome wide. I think what might be an issue is that it it's not as easy as it always sounds to create a very well annotated uh, a transposable element database. It's a lot of effort. It takes multiple uh, people to generate that. So just to maintain a free repository available for everyone, that, that might be a big of an ask uh, in which different communities have to come together to maintain a, a repository. And that's, uh, I think, what RepBase has been trying to do that for, for a number of years uh, right now. Uh, was there a second part of the question? I think the the user here wants to know, are there other ways to annotate transposable elements if you don't take kind of a rep-based approach? And the rep-based approach is uh, going to be to uh, identify repeats or repeat families, uh, very often using closely related organisms, and then identifying uh, the transposable element in this genome, uh, the set of them compared to uh, a known set. Uh, There are um, de novo transposable element identification programs that use more of a KMER approach. Repit is going to be the, a suite of programs that could, could do this without, um, as, as a kind of completely different approach from something like Repeat Masker. But, uh, you know, as far as modeling, I know there are a couple people that have certainly modeled transposable element dynamics, particularly as it pertains to, to evolution. Uh, but, but I don't know if anyone, I think there are, are good enough ways to annotate transposable elements using available sequence rather than than modeling. But I, I could be wrong here. It's, it's a big community and people love to create tools in the community. What prevents someone from like downloading uh, the, the rep base as an academic for free and then just releasing it? Is it like a copyright concern? What prevents it um, is probably something like copyright. What Why hasn't someone done it <laughs> is, is, a, is a kind of a different um, question. But uh, no, I mean, uh, again, this is not a problem that I typically run into because as an academic, I can, right. I know, I know their URL and I can go there and get what I need, but uh, <laughs> I've never searched around for an alternative source for these files. But typically, you know, with, with a lot of organisms now, uh, that organism will have a, a an official, um, uh, genome annotation of the transposable element that you can FTP to or something, you know, if you go to the, the database for that organism, whether that, be, you know, fly base or worm base or whatever organism's website, uh, if they have one, a lot of times you can find uh, an annotation file there as well. And that's truly publicly available. Yeah, I'm just thinking this is more like a copyright geek thinking me rather than a bioinformatician. But uh, of course, it depends on the country. In, in many countries, like for example, in the US, there was this landmark case that uh, facts are, are not really copyrightable. For, for something to be copyrightable, it really needs to be like some kind of artistic expression. And so I'm just uh, thinking that the, these companies, because this is limiting the companies and the companies with their army of, of lawyers, uh, they're in a good position to pick up a fight. I don't know who maintains rep base, but uh, that would be fun to to watch. Yes, yes. Uh, like, uh, and I don't exactly know that the the status of rep base either. Rep base was a, a a great thing that happened in the community from a really prominent researcher who has now passed uh, passed away. Oh. Um, so uh, I don't. Uh, I, I know the new updates keep coming along. I don't know exactly um, the individuals that are that are producing those, but I, I don't know the future of these. You know, Kashik and I here are not in the in the business of annotating genomes. We work on a couple genomes very closely, but there are other people that. Um, you know, this is what they do. They wait for the next genome to come out of you know whatever obscure organism is next, and then uh, and then work to annotate uh, these genomes. And so uh, there definitely is a community of people out there that that are producing the programs to do this. And uh, my my hope is that uh, along with everything else, that this is made truly open in the near future. Uh, user Red Concrete asks. Hi, folks. I'm working in humans, and I have a historical interest in variable multi-allelic short tandem repeats, and would like to get back to working with them. This isn't really a scientific question so much as an opportunistic way for me to find out how you would find full genome 
that is all known STRs in humans, and also whether you have ever heard of commercial services for genotyping these. I don't mean linkage map, uh, 5 to 10 centimorgan resolution genotyping, I mean comprehensive. I guess the scientific question for you is, if the above don't exist, then uh, why and what are the technical challenges that need to be overcome to create such databases, marker panels? Yeah, these, these are, this is definitely a tough part of the genome to work on because being uh, sh you know, short tandem repeats and the fact that they're tandem repeats, the idea is you know, it, it can be very difficult with current sequencing technology to understand if there's one or two of those repeats or a hundred. But, but at the same time, that's often valuable information because they can be used as markers. And that's why I think the user wants to know about a commercial service for genotyping. So they want to understand the length of these tandem repeats, how many copies there are, because um, these can be used as a marker system. This is tough. This is something that I think you could potentially do like a local KMER analysis where you could see how many times a particular word in this case not only matches it itself once, but also matches again in that same sequence. That That's one way to look for uh, kind of de novo, look for uh, tandem repeats. But there's there's uh, there are a couple of programs out there, TRAP, TRF, and TROLL are all examples of different um programs publicly available that are published um, that specifically go out and attempt to identify tandem repeats. And hopefully the programs can then be used once they're identified to then um, assay them in a, in a database. But I think that database is going to need to be some sort of uh, sequencing based uh, assay. The way we would do this typically in our organism is to put PCR primers on different sides of the uh, tandem repeat where they flank on either side and amplify across it and, and essentially just look at the, the, the size of the, the repeat. We're not actually sequencing the repeat itself, but just looking at the size of, of how long it took, you know, the size of the band that it, from one side to the other. And, uh, and that we can use as markers, but, but that requires, you know, really specifically looking on a locus specific level at each individual one. And it's hard to do as a, as a, as a, as a panel. User cute and clever asks, I'm interested in the sleeping beauty transposons. And, uh, now of course I'm interested too. So, uh, here she says, if this topic could be elaborated on, that would be great. Uh, sure. S Sleeping Beauty is pretty cool. Um, again, like I said, uh, you find it, you name it, right? So uh, Sleeping Beauty is a transposable element that when uh, there's a specific researcher that this is this has essentially been his career. His name is Zoltan Ivex. And, and Zoltan essentially looked at um, all of these transposable elements that were either fragmented or mutated derivatives uh, and lined them all up and deduced from all of these different lined up sequences, what must have been the ancestral active element before all these mutations occurred. Uh, and then he created that element uh, where there was no active element in this particular genome and put it back in and that element was active. So sleeping beauty comes from the fact that you had all these non-active transposable elements because they were mutated and then he could create and uh, wake up, I guess, uh, the full active one that must have existed previously to create these mutated copies. So the reason uh, he did all of this is because he realized the, the, the utility of transposable elements as tools. They can be used to integrate other things into the genome. They can be used for tools for research, uh, much the same way people are using CRISPR-Cas now as an initial discovery. And now uh, there's all these tools you can generate from it. Uh, transposable elements were very hot for these tools uh, for a long time. And so uh, the idea was having this active transposable element could be be used uh, and is now is in fact being used for things like uh, uh, site specific integration of, of uh, material into a genome or uh, uh, specific mutagenesis um, uh, and Sleeping Beauty is a, a really great example of uh, basic research turned into uh, applied tools. Did he just publish a paper and say well let's call this now Sleeping Beauty? Let's take some guts to say. <laughs> well, right. I can't exactly tell you the history because I, I, I've heard, you know, this has happened um, before I was in the field. But yes, to name something Sleeping Beauty, you would have had to already 
do it to realize that it can be done. So there had to be, there must have been a name earlier on, you know, a database type name for these types of transposable elements and that they renamed Sleeping Beauty. Okay. Yeah, this is often transposable elements often have their database name, um, their official name, and then and then the cute one that people have called it. Oh, right. So, so this is not like an official name. Well, Sleeping Beauty, I mean... Uh, it's it's probably more official than than the database name that no one's ever heard of, right? <laughs> so, S- Sleeping Beauty is a, is a is a uh, is a great story, and it's a great story of what we call making consensus elements. So, lining up mutated or lining up all the different elements in the genome into uh, one element, even if it doesn't exist, but that um, either must have exist or is the sort of average of all of the other elements. And in this particular, we use these informatically and we use consensus elements quite a bit in uh, in our research just to understand well what's what's a, a prototypical prototypical element of this particular family um what would that look like uh and in this case sleeping beauty which is you know the the, the average of all these um fragmented or mutated transposable elements um was actually then put back into the genome and used as a tool okay so i think the last one or other the last two uh, questions come from the user Cytokinda Girl, and uh, she presumably asks, uh, "Do we have a good idea of the normal amount of variation between humans in repetitive regions?" And the second question is also: Is there any evidence that cancerous cells preferentially gain or avoid mutations in these regions? Uh, I'm I'm not aware of any specific studies that talk about uh, how much the repetitive regions vary between humans, but I, I would like to speculate that there's probably a lot of variation uh, in these repetitive regions. Most of the time, people talk about what percentage of genes vary or what are the polymorphisms available in genes that, that, that are uh, different in different humans, but repetitive regions. I mean, you have to imagine the depth of uh, sequencing to annotate properly these repetitive regions and then to study the variation, it's a um, it's a big challenge. So uh, I, I'm not aware of any specific studies that might be uh, out there. Yeah, I think they exist. I, I think uh, the the variation uh, that we see in human genomes. You already mentioned, you know, this estimated how many live births, you know, how, how many, and then you get an ALU insertion. Um, I think the variation in the non-genic portion of the human genome is much, much higher than the, than the genic portion. So I think there's going to be uh, quite a bit of, of what we call, st- what people in the field would call structural variation, whether it's happening because of a transposable element or not. But this is basically uh, not just, you know, structural variation is in opposition to, to single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. So structural variation is plus, minus, absence, presence, uh, inverted inverted or, or translocation piece of DNA. So so transposable elements fit into that and, and are causal um, for creating those structural variations. And so I think uh, I think it's a region in which I think it's been studied. I don't think we understand that nearly as much as we understand something like the genic polymorphism level, because when people are typically sequencing human genomes, even in a, even in a hospital, in a clinical setting, they're uh, simply aligning those reads back to the, the genic regions of the genome to try to find mutations that that patient might have. But the rest of the stuff is just, uh, is just uh, trash canned because uh, they're, they're not even close to de novo assembling human genomes on a daily basis. We essentially can sequence and realign uh, or call particular SNPs. So the structural variation of human genomes um, is is probably, you know, five years to a decade behind the analysis of coding very vari- coding region variation in the human genome. Yeah, if if I remember correctly, uh, microsatellites, which are a type of, of repeats, uh, they are actually used in criminology and like to establish, you know, when when they collect yeah. the DNA from the crime scene or. Or maybe yeah. to establish paternity or, or stuff like right. that. So, so they must mutate super fast, super quickly. And those are like those those are things like repeats that can, that can evolve very quickly. And so when you see them on CSI, you know, uh, under like this really cool purple light that no lab is actually lit up with, uh, <laughs> running out running out their gels and getting results in one day, which again does not happen. And uh, they can essentially get a molecular fingerprint by looking at these highly variable and or very quickly evolving regions of the human genome, which are, they're not looking at exons, right? They are looking at uh, intergenic, typically 
tandem repeat microsatellite regions of the genome. Uh, and uh, they, they vary s so greatly that if you look at a panel or a number of these, um, you can get to the numbers in which this is like a specific fingerprint of an individual. That set of variation at those repeats is, uh, is not going to be um, present again uh, because there's not enough people on Earth, right? There's um, it's it's a it's a probability game, so therefore they can say that there's you know a one in ten billion chance that they have the the correct individual if you look at enough markers. Any thoughts on the second question about the evidence that cancer cells preferentially gain or avoid mutations in the in in these regions? Yeah, well, cancer cells again. The the main databases that we have now, like the uh, the cancer atlas, they're primarily looking at uh, coding region variation in all of these different cancers. But what we do know is that transposable element activity uh, is closely associated with very specific types of cancer. Uh, it's not thought to be the initial primary driver. It's thought to be uh, kind of on a secondary level in which the transposable elements become activated, start mobilizing. To, to duplicate uh, and create the mutations that can, uh, you know, cancer is a is a road that cells go down that that accumulate mutations, um, and part of that accum mutation accumulating process can be because of the activation of transposable elements, which will certainly speed up the whole mutagenesis of that cell. Uh, so, so closely associated with transposable elements in cancer, uh, maybe not a hundred percent causal. Uh, but um, but it, uh, again, a lot of times the the cancer research that's been done um, is is particularly bad with analyzing just coding regions versus uh, what we hoped in the future, which is the the whole genome. Cool. Any last thoughts? Anything you wanted to discuss? No, I I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity. I think uh, you know this is our favorite topic, so we we like to sit here and talk about it. But uh, I appreciate that there was uh, interest outside the laboratory and outside the community for um, consideration uh, and appreciation of transposable elements. Yeah, absolutely. I I think apart from uh, potentially a couple of experts in mobile DNA who may be listening to this podcast, for all the rest of us, this was super interesting, super new a lot of information to process. So uh, <laughs> thanks a lot, guys. No, thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank